A lot of, first, I'd like to welcome all of you to Morgan State University. I've been here about seven years, and I'm in the IT department. Um, I, my background is mathematics and physics uh, at the undergraduate level. When I was studying mathematics, physics, chemistry, they were all their own independent uh, fields. So, uh, you know, you walk out of your classroom in physics and then you go to the chemistry department and you take your chemistry. <coughs> there was not much overlap. But now all of this overlap, as you can see from Professor G's uh, uh, presentation, uh, from the biological fields to the, uh, you know, physics, chemistry, all of these are kind of overlapping. Now, I've been in correspondence with him for the last two or three years. He had conducted a course called a Duality at Rutgers University. And I had asked him, uh, you know, about the content of uh, his courses, and so we have a correspondence. And he is a, on a uh, server list called, uh, I forgot the name of that. You, did, you have a discussion, server list with people from all over the world. Oh, the semiotics. The semiotics group. I understand that he had introduced a concept called the cell force in 1974, right? Uh, or was that in 1990? 1991. Oh, 1991. Okay, but the conformum was introduced in 1974, which really started to introduce, um, you know, the concept that like a gravitational force, like a uh, electromagnetic force, there is a cell force. So in living areas. Now, This represents fermia, this represents the chemical reaction, this represents DNA. Now, why did I introduce dinosaurs? Because it's close to DNA. You know, I, I like the letters in dinosaur. But I'm going to talk about birds. I'm not going to talk about dinosaurs because what do they say? They say that dinosaurs are the ancestors of birds. Now, uh, Peter, yesterday you said that uh, biology is not a, you know, Perfect science like uh, physics, right? Did you use that word? Yeah, something like that. I wrote it down. <laughs> and, and I have to repeat it. Biology is less perfect, sorry. You didn't say physics was perfect. No, you said biology was less perfect. You know what biologists say? Biologists say, you know, I don't understand the problem with physicists. If we have a theory, Darwin's theory, that goes from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic. They can't get a theory that combines fermions with, you know, the universe, with that, you know, quantum mechanics and relativity theory. They think we have a problem. And I, and I say we, I include myself in that category because I always loved physics. But I didn't come back really to physics until I discovered uh, Peter's book. And I discovered Professor G in, in the same way. Uh, I tore the page off, the, the, the cover off, because it would poke my wife at night. And she said, get this book out of it. You would sleep with this book more than <laughs> So anyway, I tore the pages off. And so it's like very easy to read. And I've been through this several times. Oh my goodness. And when I got to page 443, and this is, of course, my uh, connection with Professor G as well. I wrote a statement that's just kind of has kept me uh, awake at night. When Peter said, he, he said, the perfect way of producing something from nothing is, of course, the Neil Poulton fermion state. And since the universe is believed to be composed entirely of fermions or fermion anti fermion combinations, bosons, the Dirac equation is, in the final analysis, the most significant way of incorporating the foundational basis for the whole of physics into a single structure. And it would appear that it is itself founded entirely on the principle of duality. You wrote that. Professor G says it's complementarity, but anyway, y'all sitting next to each other. <laughs> Ultimately, it would seem duality is not merely a component of physics, but an expression of the fundamental nature of physics itself. How many of you have heard of Gerald Holton? Gerald Holton 
is the only German that I have ever read who would talk about duality. Only Frenchmen talk about duality. You know? <laughs> Descartes, right? But he doesn't call it duality. He calls it thema anti -thema. And all of the examples of duality that I've been collecting over the years are in physics. In physics or in this book. Okay. I refer to Professor G's work uh, in this. He's at Rutgers. Conduct, I don't know if you still teach this duality class, yes. undergraduate class. I'd like to attend it sometime. Uh, but oh, maybe you can come and give a talk. Okay. How many? I, I would like to. Uh, how, how many of you attended this the conference in 2012? I believe I'd like to see your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. My goodness. I thought all of you have. How many of you, how many of you have attended the previous conference? 2010. 2010, right? Which one? That was where? In London also, wasn't it? Yes. College. In no. yeah. Imperial College. Imperial College. Imperial College, so there was two. Okay, how many of you have, have never attended, you attended 2010? Imperial College. In 20, how many never attended a, a conference for this year? Oh my goodness, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, did you know that, Richard? Yeah. We I, small, I did. We have small <laughs> Those of you who have an article in here, could you autograph it for me? <laughs> <laughs> and while I continue with this. Okay, so here we go. Uh, zero totality, this is my paper if you haven't read it in the, in the last proceedings. How did I make zero totality and generalization of Newton's third law? I, look, I like to keep things simple. Uh, but what did Albert Einstein, Einstein say? That don't make it any simple, right? Uh, I like to keep things simple. Now look, action equal negative reaction to me was action plus reaction equals zero. Okay, I gotta go back. I have to give you a little history. The new math was abandoned in the late 1960s, right? 1969. Why was it introduced the Sputnik Challenge? 1957. String theory begins when the new math ends. And now people are all strung out on string theory. <laughs> that's what they say. I, that's not me. Hundred years they said it would take to, to, to actually solve the equations and things in string theory. Some of them say they're in a cul-de-sac. Another uh, Russian String theorists said 40 year careers have been lost. I lived in Texas. Waxahachie, Texas has, they were building a super collider around the city. And you know, Texas is farmers. They were telling farmers they're going to blow up the cows and, and, and the whole area would be. They have only half of it completed. They didn't complete the rest. Not even half. Not even half. You're, you're absolutely right. They, they saved the cost too much. But look, not all, not all is lost. Extra dimensions. And I was privy to a conversation between Richard Amoroso and Peter Rollins who, who Peter said, look, simply because you can show extra dimensions, it does not prove string theory. And I was happy to hear that. Very happy. But look, how many American born here in this room? American born. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I include myself. Why am I pointing that out? When the war, the, 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 the opposition by students to the, US, to the war in Vietnam was also resulted in opposition that, to anything that supported that war. Science, technology, went out the window. Forty years later, we are still feeling the effects in America. I have had students, I taught math many years, that said, <coughs> my high school teacher said I didn't have to take a math class if I didn't want to. This is still, I mean, this was, I'd say, in the early 80s, in the middle 80s. Okay, so now, if you look at these universities, Ten of them I've listed here. Ninety percent are international students. Ninety percent and over. University of Missouri, Kansas City, 
you know, uh, Purdue University. University of Purdue. Okay. This is, I mean, it's a, it's a well-known fact that we went to the moon because of German technology. Now we're going to our space stations, Russian technology. Okay. I'm sorry? Which blows up. <laughs> but it shows you what's, what has happened over this period of time. All of these statistics go out to Wikipedia. The, the number of PhD students in science, engineering, uh, mathematics, physics. So the new math, string theory, you're not going to find many American students in engineering and sciences these days. Okay? So where was I? In 1971, mm -hmm. I was studying the Riccati equation. And the Riccati equation <coughs> is a first order, second degree equation. Okay. So <coughs> my first thought about duality was then. Do you know? Now if you know a special solution, call it Y1, of the Riccati equation, you can write the general solution. But now, now here's, here's what was missing in that, in that study. What was missing in that study, if I set C1 equal to zero, I can produce now a second particular solution. And I get a second general solution. Now here's the interesting thing about that. that you cannot produce with this general solution based upon the special solution, you cannot produce G1, Y1. You cannot, you cannot get it unless C1 goes to infinity. Similarly, you cannot <coughs> produce the special solution C Y2 in the general solution unless C2 goes to infinity. But now watch this, C1 equal to zero C1 equal to zero will give us Y2. C2 equal to zero will give us Y1. For me, these two things tied together, I mean, I thought, what? Anyway, I've carried this with me. This is the relationship between the two special solutions. Now, I look at this as Newton's third law. Action, reaction and there's zero totality. Now, if I want to look at this in the context of Hamilton's principle, I would multiply both sides of the equation by H. Now, now remember where the uh, F, G, and H can come from. Okay, so if I multiply both sides of this equation by H integrate, I get this, I call it an action. It's similar to Hamilton's principle, where the derivative is equal to zero. So, now this is in the context of zero totality. I didn't present it in, my la in, in, in the last paper because I'm gonna go back to this for a minute. Hamilton's principle of least action, or principle of station action, is also for me a zero totality condition, where, where uh, L is the Lagrangian. Okay, so now in 1769, Euler showed that if you is a special, is a solution of a linear second order differential equation, then this is the solution, U prime over U is the solution of a Riccati equation. So now what people are, have, have done, like Haley, is has demonstrated the underrated entanglement between Riccati and Schrodinger equation. Okay, so where does that lead us? Now to Peter's book. Okay. Zero to infinity. Oh, that by the way, that's the cover. Is uh, in 2007. I found it in 2009. The interesting thing is, I went out to Amazon. The book was $150. But they and the tax was seven dollars. I went out there the next day. They switched the tax. The tax and the price of the book. I said, seven dollars? Uh, are they crazy? I ordered it. I got the book for seven dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I emailed them and I said, look, I need a second copy. Say, sorry, we don't have any more. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
A similar <coughs> thing happened. Now this is in 09. A similar thing happened when Peter put his his recent publication out there. I went to World Scientific and I downloaded all the PDF files. So I emailed him and I said, Peter, I thought they were charging sixty dollars for the book. He said, Yeah, they are. I said, Well, I got them all free. He said, How? And I told him I'm on an iPhone and I downloaded. I was going over to my computer. By that time, Peter contacted them. By the time I got to my computer, I couldn't download it anymore. <laughs> anyway, I got that one for seven bucks, so I'll, I'll pay for the other. <laughs> okay, so what did I read from page 443? Four, Zero to infinity, foundations of physics. That's, I read that statement, right? Ultimately, it would seem duality is not merely a component of physics, but an expression of the fundamental nature of physics itself. Okay, so how do we get here? This is, now I'm gonna talk about duality. Spin orbit coupling, the double helix, uh, gives free energy, how that fits into the, uh, I, I call it, they call it mass action, like Hamilton's principle, but this, I'm gonna wait till the end. Avian ancestors. Okay, so now, how do we, uh, 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 what, what Peter says is that, is that zero is somehow privileged in mathematics. You know, you got a positive one, negative one. We can't talk about any number system, quaternions, complex, unless you have its inverse. Okay? Same thing applies with the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, integration, differentiation. This is not part of his quote, but he said, mathematics can be regarded as an emergent property of a system <coughs> privileging zero totality. The question we need to ask, is physics equally emergent? And I, I, I agree with him, but based upon a duality concept. All right, now, just as a simple example, this may not fit the model, but I'm going to show you statistics privileges zero. If you have three numbers, you find the mean, you subtract the mean from each of the numbers, then you're going to have, I call them element one, two, and three. The sum of those has to, the, mean, the, sum, the, the sum of the differences <clears throat> have to equal zero. Why do we square things in statistics is, and then take the square root? Hey, it's, we're doing an operation and then it's inverse. You know, that's, that to me is a duality. But if you look at these two, I mean, E1 plus E2 uh, is the dual of E3 because of some of those two. But if you take a thousand, a billion, no matter what it is, you can combine elements, I mean, then say zero is privilege. Okay. What are the things that are privileged? Uh, what are the fundamental parameters uh, in physics? <coughs> the foundation of physics? Space, time, mass, and charge. Uh, in his presentation yesterday, he talked about those. Okay, and then he talks about the symmetry of those dualities. They can be distributed between the two sets, three three sets of opposing paired categories according to this follow to the scheme. Space is real, non-conserved, divisible. Time is imaginary, non-conserved, indivisible. Mass real, conserved, indivisible. Charge is imaginary, conserved, and divisible. So the symmetry of the properties and anti-properties creates the possibility of a total conceptual nothing, nothingness. Okay, now, I don't know why you don't say it, but I think it, whenever I read your work, that space and time are inverses of each other. I mean, you've essentially characterized it as property, anti-property, but you don't say this. Why? Uh, I'll let him answer that because I, this is what I think is also part of the dirac neil Polton equation. That when you write it, that these are somehow tied in as inverses to each other. The physicists maybe have to deal with what that means. The mathematics you can manipulate. Okay, so what are some string theory duality? T duality, S duality, U duality. Okay, where space transformed from the radius to the inverse. I mean, isn't that what's going on here too? Uh, I don't know. 
Okay, so if we take the Dirac equation in matrix form, it, quote, it causes fragmentation by mixing up energy, momentum, and mass terms, as well as other major problems. This is in chapter five of Breaking the Dirac Code. So, the classical relativistic momentum energy conservation equation derived from the nil potent operator form of the Dirac state vector is what he showed yesterday. Okay, so the Minkowski, uh, how is this related? I mean, these are related also to the Pythagorean theorem. The Minkowski <coughs> metric was used by Einstein to postulate what the constancy of the speed of light. I know nobody, none of you call this a Dirac metric. I call it a Dirac metric because it has the same structure of the Minkowski metric. But Rowlands used it to postulate the nothingness or zero totality of nature. And both of these originate in a Pythagorean relationship. So what is the Dirac state? Well, time, space, mass, and charge are associated with imaginary, real, uh, the uh, uh, vectors, and quaternions. And using charge as the identity, then you can construct the Dirac equation. That's, I think, essentially what uh, how you selected these three parameters, associating them with. Uh -oh. <laughs> Wake up, cool. <laughs> Did I need to use this? I better turn this off. I, I speak kind of loud. Yeah. And Richard and I together, if you're in the same room with us, uh, you're going to have to wear earmuffs. My wife came down last night. You all have to lower your voices. <laughs> you, were, you were a good guest last night. <laughs> okay, so now the book that uh, Peter uh, has recently published is based on, I mean, if you don't want to pay $60, look, we'll watch him out on YouTube. That's what I did here. <laughs> And FOPL4, well, if you go to YouTube and just search on FOPL4 or Peter's name, uh, he says FOPL4 and 5 are really the crux of the series. And I've, I've had to listen to them several times. I may get the book because I've had to take down too many notes. Uh, which other one would you point out? Three. Number three. Three, three four, and five. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. All of you are aware of Newton's warning. O oh, physics, beware of metaphysics, right? Einstein, in uh, 1954, aware of this admonition, referred to himself as a tame metaphysicist. In, in, uh, I forgot the name of the book. Does, does anyone know, remember the name of that book? Uh, I say that actually <laughs> Professor Rowlands has tamed the metaphysics. How? Rowlands emphasizes that the factor two expresses dualities which are fundamental to the creation of both mathematics and physics. And duality provides, he didn't say method, uh, metaphysics, it provides a philosophy on which both can be based. See, uh, this metaphysical principle of duality, I mean, we can go off in many different directions. But a metaphysical uh, 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 philosophy of duality will, has tamed for me metaphysics. Now, Professor G, I know complementarity in Pierce logic is, is very significant in your work. And you know what I've done to it. I've reduced it to three dualities. Because in your triangles, I take one duality, two dualities, and then the third one. So be, they're just three coupled dualities. But the nice thing is they're coupled in, in, you know, they're coupled together, and you usually use a triangle to, to describe them. Marx said, these are philosophers, right? That he stood Hegel on his head by turning his idealistic dialectic into a dialectical materialism. And he believed that philosophers had to stop interpreting the world in endless metaphysical debates and start change in the world. That's traditional philosophers, right? Those words drive me crazy. But I, you know, my wife can read through a book and, uh, uh, you know, enjoy it. And, uh, I mean, she looks, looks at me looking at one equation and I never move from it. 
And she finished her book, and I'm still looking at that equation. Well, for me, you know, those symbols and mathematical symbols, just something I like to turn around in my head. But she likes to go through all those words. I can't do that. It's just too, too much. But Lagrange never said that he stood Newton on his head. In New Lagrangian mechanics based on integration techniques, you have an action principle. But he never said, I stood Newton on his head, that used deferential techniques. But these philosophers did. They felt like they, that to me, that's a duality. You look at it this way, I always felt like I'm reading a philosopher. By the time I get to it, well, this is what the other philosopher was doing. So if I read it all backwards, you know, hey, I'd have the other philosopher. <coughs> to me, that's, that's the philosophy courses as an undergraduate always did that to me. <laughs> we are talking about two inverse operations. That's a duality. Okay, so now, the Dublin mechanism that uh, Peter refers to is, uh, you know, explains quite a few things. Uh, the Aharonov Bohm effect, counting and generating numbers are created at the same time as the concepts of discreteness, non conservation, and orderability, which are dual to continuity, conservation, and non -order orderability. This is the taming of metaphysics for me from the from the warning that Newton gave. Okay, so in the most general terms, the factor two is an expression of the fundamental duality in the whole concept of nature in physics, mathematics, and even ontology and epistemology. The duality that is the result of trying to create something from nothing, and in principle the attempt is only possible is zero, if zero is also the end result. Since the universe is believed to be composed entirely of fermions or fermion anti fermion combinations, again, that's that statement that I read. I had to get to page 443 of his book to do that. To, I mean, to, uh, to uh, you know, integrate my uh, understanding of dualistic concepts over the last 40 years in, in, in this framework. But I feel that it applies more than just to physics. I, I, there are a lot of uh, uh, areas that it does, and I'm going, to, I'm going to show you quickly. All right, well, anyway, the three fundamental du dualities, the, the Dirac equation, Thomas' precession, potential of kinetic energy, integrate those also characteristics that, that he has paired. Unless we look at these, these are just going to be, they're going to be monsters, I mean, to, to deal with. Okay, so from a purely physical point of view, the Dirac mill pole would be would be would appear to be the perfect way of producing something from nothing. The Dirac mill pole represents the most concise packaging of the dualistic information contained in the parameter group. The process of quantization of energy, momentum, and rest mass. It seems that we get something from nothing, not just in a physical way by perfect symmetry between the parameters denying overall characterization, but also literally by making the fundamental unit of our characterization a square root of zero, and that this becomes zero in the Dirac equation. Many significant aspects of physics are explained through a direct investigation of this fundamental principle. And I think that's what he means by the foundation of physics, based upon this principle, and I think he'll probably elaborate on that, on that later. So nothing is not a scientific term. I mean, we all know that. Even when referring to a vacuum, it's a region of space has no matter, but it still can contain gravitational fields. Zero is the starting point for a set of mathematical and physical rules used in constructing objects that preserve the original structures. Conjugation is a process that conserves a zero state, and it is how we can go from zero to infinity, preserving nothingness. So here's some examples of how this nil potency concept applies zero any energy inflationary universe matter antimatter uh, fermions chemical equilibrium uh, chemical reactions zero energy inflationary well, that's the second one okay so here here's uh, on, on uh, the principle of law of mass action where we have a constant and here we can see now zero totality applied. That's how I apply zero totality in the case of chemical reactions. He's done the work for fermions and anti-fermions. 
But so now this is just another application. But here is a, is a paper in 1972 that shows a dynamical approach to chemical kin uh, kinetics, mass action laws as generalized Riccati equations. What are some of the other areas? DNA. Uh, <coughs> Elizabeth, not our Elizabeth, is she here? No, yeah. Not yet. Uh, Reaper showed that a single base contains information about its neighbor. That's in the DNA structure. And questions the notion that individual DNA bases are independent bits of information. I, you know, I have a reference to, uh, uh, you know, her her paper. Avian compass, quantum super, superposition, and entanglement are sustained in the living system for at least tens of seconds. The, art, the paper, quantum coherence, entangle, entanglement in the avian compass. So I think you can see, I've gone from the fermion scenario that, that uh, Peter describes to chemical reactions. Now we're, we're, we want to move into the uh, DNA structure and living matter. So what I did in my paper is, I, I'm seeing this, uh, this zero, zero totality, I'm replacing it with a Z. Because it seems zero totality now accommodates a lot of concepts. Whether it's a numerical value, like zero, it could be an object at rest, any object moving with constant velocity, any object experiencing zero total net force, or some talking about Newton's third law, an equilibrium point, a stability condition, an adiabatic condition, a steady state condition, a symbiosis, a balance, a symmetry condition, homeostasis, stationary point, and so on and so forth. All of those are, 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 are uh, categories of zero totality for me. So that's how I used it in the generalization of Newton's third law. So each of these, Z1, Z2, Z3, up to Z10, represents now a zero condition. Five minutes? Ten. Ten minutes. Okay. So anyway, that's in my paper. Now, okay, let me skip this slide. I'm sure you're going to talk about zero bewigo. Bewigo. Zero bewigo. Zero bewigo. And its origin in topology. Uh, so we, 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 uh, we know that this trembling motion, which, it, which is what it means in German, you know, harmonic oscillation is the same thing. So there it goes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did I miss one slide? Sorry about that. Oh, I, I put these in blue. Why? I don't know if... Uh, Professor Jonathan uh, ben Bentwich came to the conference. Bentwich, uh, he is a uh, researcher in Israel. And, you know, I don't like to simplify people's work. They spend many years on research. But that's how I write his work. And I forgot to tell you, why do I put these uh, extra? I'm using the plus to indicate Newton's, all of this is Newton's third law. Action, reaction, action, reaction. That the action, re uh, action plus reaction equals zero is the framework of Newton's third law. So this is all of these are. Now, why do I put some extra parentheses? Because sometimes, you know, the push and the pull, and I'm, gonna, I'm applying it to relativity. I didn't write it down here. I was a little shy to do that. I didn't, I, I didn't want to have people throwing rotten tomatoes. Push plus pull is equal to Z. Zero totality condition, based upon Newton's third law. But look at all the other areas. Uh, entropy, hey, all of the disorder in entropy tied to evolution, where order emerges, that's, that is a third law. That is, that is Newton's third law. And zero totality combined together. This statement here is Bentwich's duality principle. He calls it a duality principle. I just summarize it with this thing. Okay, so. In the discussion about general relativity yesterday, I took, a, I forgot what page, well, no, it's on page, 
maybe 452, where a simple proposition gave me an understanding, really, of general relativity that I didn't have before. Peter says that general relativity is not a theory of gravity. That's why I asked you the question, what would you call it? And you, you said a theory of gravity, didn't you? Yeah. You, you said that. And I said, okay, then we're not having a theory about gravity. It seemed more like a theory of gravity. And I, I think that uh, you know, the evaluation or discussion of that is still ongoing. General relativity is a description of the epistemology of the gravitational field, not its ontology. So, well, I'll leave that, okay. This is how I apply Newton's third law to now and zero totality to both inertia and gravity. And Peter, you said it. You said it in these words. The Newtonian classical equations and the Einsteinian field equations become ways of approaching the same problem from opposite ends. I'm going to tell you, when they made me read those philosophers in, in, in elements, and I would read those philosophers, and then they give me a new philosopher to read, but by the time I got to the end of the first one, I knew I was reading the second one. They, it, it, it just can't be, people can't help it. It is, you get, you, and, and there is a Frenchman, uh, any French speakers in here? French speakers. Who, who, is, who is the one who made the presentation here at Johns Hopkins University? Uh, who talked about La Différence, Derrida. D does the name ring a bell with you? D-E-R-R-I-D-A? Yeah, it's well done. Okay. What does he do? He reverses what he calls the theme. He does it with every philosopher. Holton does the same thing. Theme, anti-theme. I know I am in the realm called metaphysics, but Peter has tamed that metaphysics in zero totality and my understanding of how Newton's law applies. Okay, the only people who have ever used the word dynamic in reference to a duality is Chinese researchers at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. You know a duality concept, what is it, yin and yang? I mean, it's very old in Chinese philosophy. They've applied this in the symbiosis and pathogenesis. They say, we need to get sick. Why? Because then the body recovers. And this zero biwigum goes back, it's a harmonic oscillator. That's what they mean by dynamic duality. They're the only ones that use that. Okay, what, is, what does Peter do in, in, in the, in the dirac mill pope equation? Look, he ties all of these things together in one equation. Particles, waves, and look, one column is what? Con continuous, the other side discrete. I mean, I don't know if you listed them on one page. You may have. I think there were partial listings on, on various pages. But one is all what? Discrete, the other one all continuous. Uh, can I say discreteness plus <laughs> continuity is equal to Z? Yeah, I'd like to someday. I'd like one of you to say that. I mean, if. If, if that's what is implied. The first time, I, I, had, I had a problem dealing with your word nothing. Because the first time I, my son was in first grade and I was showing him how to add numbers, but he wrote this, he wrote this down. He said, is, that, is it correct, Dad, is it correct to say that? And so I thought about it for a minute. And I wanted to make it correct for him. I didn't want to say no. You know, you know hey, I've had too many no's. Two three minutes. minutes. Three minutes. I said yes. But only if zero is regarded as nothing. Then nothing makes it right. I bet he was confused. <laughs> <laughs> That's what? I bet he was confused. No, no. Oh, no. Yes, he was. No, nothing will make that. And he, nothing made, he felt sad. When I put that zero in, he was happy. Even in first grade. <laughs> okay. Now, Peter's factoring techniques. There's a precedence for it, right? Factorization of the hypergeometric equation. Uh, 
that <laughs> determining quantum mechanical eigenvalues, eigen factorization uh, method by infield, uh, infield and, and, and hub. Dynamical breaking of supersymmetry, went and did it based upon a factorization. Okay, now, look, I'm just going to show you this, this uh, I took a screenshot. Why? Because in the discussion of Riccati's equation, look, here it is down here. In the discussion, the factorization of the Dirac equation, we can get it with Witten's method, reduce it now to a Riccati equation, only one solution is ever discussed. Okay, so if only one solution is discussed, I'll give you an, an example here. Zero is obviously a solution of that differential equation. All right, here's the, here's the general solution based upon zero. If I set C1 equal to zero, I get the second special solution, minus one. I generate my second special solution. I cannot get the special solution from the general solution produced by zero and vice versa. Why, why is that important? It, hey, there's all those graphing calculators out there. You can graph many versions of these. Now, here's zero, the one special solution, and here's minus one. These, where's minus one? Special solution, I didn't draw minus one. Uh-oh, I left it out. Anyway, it's here, right? What I have found, and some of your drawings, Gauss and, and, and Plum, you see, those curves that are forced between the two, and I, I haven't investigated this, but you, you suggested it, they are, spe they are special solutions of a, of a Riccati equation in which everything else is forced between. Maybe. Okay, so Riccati and DNA, here are some references. DNA harmonic oscillator, uh, connection between biology and physics in, in your book. Of course, that book, it wasn't the, I think you have some uh, PDFs out there with the color, color slides. Uh, okay, now, this, I've asked a couple of people this question. Miss T, can you distribute that paper? I don't. I want to. I don't. I, I don't want uh, uh, a, a, a a response that uh, is spontaneous. No, I, w I want you to really think about this question. We know addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, integration, differentiation are inverse operations. Okay. My question is a geometric question to you. Why is slope inverse to area? <coughs> Why is slope inverse to area? And finally, finally, uh, Ms. T is going to just, I'd like you to jot your, your ideas on the back of that paper. I'm going to collect them all. And I'm going to include it in, in my paper. But look, grand unification. Foundational principle that unifies physics, biology, chemistry, and almost every other academic discipline. Duality-based, zero totality condition. All right, so that implies that unification is impossible. Unification is impossible. If it's a duality, you cannot have a single force. You cannot. The dream is really a dream. <laughs> because you have to have two. You give me one force, I'm going to find the dual to it. So... That's a summary of my thoughts. I hope I've been clear, and I appreciate your, your, your <coughs> attendance. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Oh, no, 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 no. Very, very quick. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so look, I, I for look, I forgot to tell you about the dinosaurs, right? Yeah. What are these? Birds. They are supposed to be descended from dinosaurs. Okay, I used to raise pigeons in Texas, homing pigeons. Peter, take me one minute. Okay. We, 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 need, we need to uh, only one question. Okay, look, yeah. I used to put my trash can pails with water in the summertime on my back lawn. My birds would get out there. Have you seen how birds wash? You know, they'll splash in the water, right? But what do they do after that? They got to dry their wings. So they'll sit, pigeons will sit out like this. Okay, now, one day I was watching. And, of course, if you have birds on the ground and you stand up, it's like a bird, even my birds, okay. Even I take a mile, a mile, and they come back 10 miles. Ago. I had my hands on the ground, and I said, wait a minute. They are standing 
on their, what we call their feet, right? <coughs> it's their hands. This is their wings. This is their wings. Okay. So what I did is I started looking at the inversion. Did you know that only in birds, well, some fish, only in birds, the female carries the XY? As males, we carry the XY chromosome, right? But not all biological species. Birds, the female carries the XY, but they do not care, call it XY, they call it WZ. Okay. I want you now to look at me. The back end of a duck can do this. That's why you never want to go in the water where ducks have been. Or other birds. Chickens do the same thing. They can suck it in and spit it out. They operate like our mouth. Okay? Legs and wings. You know what H5N1 is? H5N1 is called bird flu. It is a digestive problem for birds, but it is a respiratory problem for us. There's some women now here. I'm going to leave the last one. But that's going to be included in my paper. I want to tell you that if you take my head and put it to the ground, that is the back end of the duck. So where is his head? You take my that intestine, you know a swan's neck, and you put two eyes on it, that's the intestines or the neck of the bird. That's the for, and it's called an inverted morphology, an evolutionary inverted morph morphology. So what I'm, you see, birds when they feed the young, they stick their beak inside of their parents' mouth where partial digestion takes place. Not here. Doesn't partial digestion take place in our lower intestine? That's the neck of the bird. Put two eyes on it. I, I finished there. And that's the zero totality condition. Okay, great. Thanks for